consequences. Those inertia barriers are critical because they delineate three economic states, one of peace, of relative competition, one of war, fight for survival, and one of growth, an age or time of wonder. So I'll go through these. You start off with something in the peace phase, often a product, it's relative competition, you're number one, I'm number one. Sustaining change exceeds disruptive change, it's a period of high profitability. Um, we build up inertia to change because of our past success. Um, but the thing is still evolving because of competition. It becomes suitable for more utility provision, for provision as a commodity. New entrants who are not encumbered by pre-existing business model move into this space. So, for example, hosting, it would be Amazon. This causes a rapid growth of new activities, things built on top of these systems. You get new emerging practices which create the rate, increased rates of efficiency, agility, and also new sources of worth. Um, this trickle becomes a flood because we're all competing and we all have to keep up with each other. And eventually you see disruption of the past giants who are stuck behind inertia barriers. And then that new activities go through the same cycle. Um, and the reason why we call it a war, literally, is because it is a fight for survival for those companies. Now that cycle of peace, war, and growth occurs both in local ecosystems and a macroeconomic scale. So this is Coletta Perez's work. Same pattern reappears, and by macroeconomic scale, we call these ages. So things like the industrial age, mechanical age, electrical age. And what's also interesting is every time we go through the war phase of one of these, we also get new forms of organization appearing because of those new practices. So we end up with things like Fordism, the American system. Uh, web 2.0. So if you look at something like the age of electricity, which wasn't kicked off by the Parthian battery, but in fact utility provision of a pre-existing activity by Westinghouse, not Edison. Edison ran around saying AC is rubbish, tried to get government to ban it. When he failed to do so, then decided to buy out Westinghouse and reinvent himself as the father of the AC utility. This caused an explosion of growth of new activities, such as Hollywood, such as teletyping. It created a time of dreams of magic, as Hawkins used to say, unless you happen to be a gas lamp lighter, in which case it wasn't much good news. Same with textile industry. And of course, all this change in new practice enabled things like Fordism to appear. And if you look at the mechanical age, it's exactly the same pattern. The internet age, exactly the same pattern. The internet age, the new orgs, we called them the Web 2.0. Now, one other thing that happens is it's not just activities and practices evolve, but also data as well. It moves from unmodeled to modeled. And every time we go through the war phase where we see this explosion of new activities, we also see an explosion of unmodeled data. And then we have endless arguments over classification. So if I go back to sort of Georgian times, um, we used to have arguments over Linnaeus and Buffoon. How do we classify all the natural history data? Um, Victorian times, it was more uh, Cutter versus Dewey Decimal. How do we classify all the books and catalogues, etc., that we're producing? Uh, these days, we call it no sequel versus sequel. Uh, so you can sort of, this is, that was big data Georgian style. This is big data today style. So this war cycle, war part of the economic cycle, is associated with new entrants, uh, new practices, new forms of organization, rapid growth, explosions of new data, disruption of past industries, and adoption concerns by people in the market. And when we talk about cloud computing, which is simply a shift from products and rental services to more commodity and utility services, and therefore is part of a war, what do we see? We see new entrants, we see adoption concerns, we just see disruption, we see things like DevOps, we hear about big data and rapid growth of new companies. This is completely and utterly normal. And in fact, it's so normal, it was talked about by a chap called Douglas Parkhill in 1966 in the book, uh, The Challenge of the Computer Utility, where he predicted in the future computing is to be more like electricity, we would have public, private, government compute utilities, and describe some of the social consequences of that. That was 40 odd years ago. So quick recap, um, process of diffusion, process of evolution. Uh, that process of evolution, from, in, driven by competition, takes us from genesis of new activities to more utility provision, creates a cycle of change. We often have inertia 
uh, to that because of change of practice as well, our legacy estates or past success. And that inertia is important because it delineates three economic states, one of peace, one of war, one of growth. The war state's the most interesting because that's where you get these economic, these major changes, you know, new entrants, explosions of new data, rapid growth, new practice. So now I'm going to talk about organizations. Um, in particular, um, these appear in that war cycle. In that war cycle, that's where you get these new practices, so you get these new forms of company, things like Fordism. A couple of years ago, I did a survey, companies out there, and what you'd expect to see are traditional organizations and the Web 2.0 who are associated with the last cycle, which is all about commoditization of the means of mass communication, the internet. And you'd expect to see traditional learning from Web 2.0, so things like social media, etc. Um, but we also found that a new form of organization was budding off. And these are associated to the practices and activities related to commoditization, related to cloud. And some of these are small companies. Some of them have market caps of 100 billion. So structure. I thought I'd list a few of the differences. And this is traditional, and this is next generation, because they're the most polar extremes. So structure and traditional, very much departmental. Um, in the next generation, they're very much cell-based. And to explain why, uh, think about an online shop. An online shop isn't actually one thing. It's a mass of different activities underneath it. Um, so it's a mass of practice, uh, different types of data, etc. Now, the structure they use is to break everything down into small components and services. So Amazon quite famously uses what's known as the two pizza rule, i.e. no team within Amazon is bigger than can be fed by two pizzas, uh, 12 people. Um, now, why this works, uh, I'm going to have to talk about ice cream, um, because ice cream is my favorite subject, um, but also because the, uh, the color-coordinated scheme at the back sort of looks like Neapolitan ice cream. When we look at our value chain, we've got activities, some of which are chaotic. That's the far left-hand side, the genesis, the poorly understood, rapidly changing, and some of which are more the commodity utility. They're linear, so they're well-defined, understood, predictable, measurable. So chaotic, rare, future worth, uncertain, focus on difference. Over here, commodity, commonplace, cost of doing business, focus on efficient automation. Now, whenever we talk about activities, practices, and data, all of them are evolving from that chaotic to the linear stage. So who cares? Why does that matter? Well, let's talk about management, something simple, project management. If you try to manage something like an online shop, which is a mass of activities with something like Six Sigma, very structured method, or Prince2, it's very good for the, these activities on the right-hand side, the linear, because it reduces deviation. But it sucks when it comes to innovation. And so we often then say, let's use Agile. And Agile has the reverse problem. It's very good at the innovation side, the creation side, the genesis, because it encourages uncertainty and deviation. It sucks at the linear. And so we end up with these sort of ridiculous debates of Agile versus Six Sigma, no different from NoSQL versus SQL. Um, the point is, there is no one-size-fits-all methodology. You have to use multiple. And that matters because the stuff on the left is about your future survival, future worth, and the stuff on the right, which is about operational efficiency, is about survival today. And any organization, you need to look at both. Now, the only people who sort of benefit from this are actually vendors, um, particularly when you outsource things. So if you, say, outsource your online shop to some sort of vendor, and they decide to use an applied method, uh, structured methodology, things like Prince2, um, this, this is very good for dealing with those commodity activities, highly efficient, which is great for them because they can show you that uh, we've been efficient. But it sucks when it comes to those uncertain changing activities and it always ends up with rampant change control costs, unsurprisingly. Um, but that's okay because as a vendor you can say it was your fault uh, because you didn't know what you wanted and we've got all the evidence to show you. And invariably, you can get a bunch of consultants to come in and explain to the, uh, to the customer that, uh, they are, that it was their fault they applied the whole process wrongly. Um, the reality is it wouldn't work anyway. Uh, those activities were uncertain. They had to deviate. So the best thing to do is actually to break things into the components and use the right methodology. 
Now, we're all in competition with each other, so it's okay for us to get this wrong uh, and to suck at managing this stuff as long as everybody else does. Um, the only problem occurs when companies start to suck less. Um, and so this is the whole two pizza thing. What people like Amazon do is they break things down into smaller components connected by services. And the advantage of that is you're more likely to use the right methodologies and techniques for the activities under control.